back in the shop and I'm very excited to share with you how to get results with kiln dried wood. In the last session, as you may remember, what I was doing was I was taking a log and splitting it and shaving it with control, following the fibers and then bending it. And that works out really well. Green wood really lends itself nicely to the shaving and the bending process. And because you've split the piece out, you know the fiber line is pretty much followed regardless of what kind of waves or twist the tree had. When a board is sawn, it's not going to do that for you. But first, before we really jump into this, I want to talk about the goals that I'm trying to achieve when I'm uh, working the wood, be it the green wood or the kiln dried wood. Like, what are we, what's the really important end result supposed to be and why is it so critical? Then I want to talk about how green wood does and doesn't sometimes meet those requirements easily. And then I want to show you how you can get those results out of dried wood. So first of all, let's talk about the results that I'm going for. I want parts to be uh, thin, light, flexible and strong. And, and following the fibers is really the way to go about that. If you can include as much of the long fibers in a piece, the flexibility is going to be there. There's not going to be the short grain problem where you're going to find a breakage or it beginning to run out on you when, you when you bend the piece. It's just really helpful in a lot of different ways. Other ways that you're going to find that it's helpful to have the long fibers intact is when you're shaving a piece. So for instance, once I've got a piece where it is following the fibers and I go to shape a work piece out of it, I know that basically I can always cut from thick to thin here. So if I'm on this face, I can just cut from the thick area back down this way and this way on opposite faces and know that it's going to follow without any run out at all, no, no pecking out, no, no splitting action. It's, it's, it's absolutely going to be a perfectly clean cut. And that makes it really speed along the process quite a great deal, as well as continue to keep that strength in the workpiece. By following uh, the, the fiber line right down the middle of this piece, it ensures me that, let, let's say I'm at the top of a bead here, I can go from the very highest point and know that cutting downhill that way and then cutting downhill this way are going to yield me perfectly smooth results all the way around. That really speeds up the process, makes the turning easier, and it just makes a better surface quality in general. So it, it really does a lot for me there, not to mention again the strength. So I can have very thin parts here and know that there's no short grain cutting across them, weakening the piece. So one of the great benefits of greenwood that you just can't deny is that when you've split a piece out of a log, it is going to basically follow the fiber. So whatever twist or, or, or bow there is to, to the log is literally going to be in the piece. It's, it's naturally going to follow that. So you don't have to worry about that. A saw doesn't do the same thing. It's going to take a little bit more work to get those straight pieces out of a board. But when you split it like this, you know it's in there. It's not anything like a perfect board at this point. It really does, you can see, follow what the tree was doing. And that's the critical point there. The other nice thing about that material at that point is it's green enough to be worked really easily with hand tools. It's already soft, so the, the fiber line is really easy to follow with a draw knife. It makes the splitting and shaving really effective. And once you've split and shaved the piece, of course, bending it is really easy because there's moisture throughout it. The, the lignin has never been set by being dried out, there, and it just transmits the heat right to the middle of the piece, and you're going to find that it plasticizes really easily. That's all benefits you just can't deny with green wood. But there are problems with green wood, as, as just about anyone who's ever tried to work it knows, and that comes with access. Some people just don't live in a region where there's access. Other people have trouble developing the resources in their region to get access. You know, if you're trying to buy one log, that can be a really high hurdle. If you do get one log that's a decent log, hopefully, what you're going to find then is you have to transport it, you have to split it, and you have to store it. And these can all be challenges depending on what season you're in or what you're trying to make. So if you're trying to make one chair, splitting out just a little bit, then you become all worried about losing the rest of the log to rot, especially if it's like summer or something like that. In winter, it's a non-issue. But in summer, that's going to be a problem with woods, especially like a maple that is going to rot pretty easily. With oak, you'll do a little bit better. So this brings us around to working with the dried woods. Now, the big problem with the dried wood, besides the fact that it's already been hardened, we're going to be able to work that out, is the fact that a saw has probably met this piece of wood, this tree, and ignored the fiber line. Because trees aren't perfect cylinders. If they would, we could just through saw them and follow that fiber line perfectly with every uh, part that we cut out of it. But trees tend to have a taper to them. They tend to have a twist to them. They tend to have a bow of some sort to them. So when you look at a board, it's much more likely that you're going to see something like this, where you can tell because of the growth rings that you see and the fact that it gets thinner in here, that indeed this, this, this tree was bowed a little bit and the saw went straight down it. So what I'm going to work on today with you is showing you how to read a board and then how to manipulate the board so you can extract these very same straight grain pieces out of it.
Then I'm going to show you how you can soak the board and then get it back to a point that you can plasticize it with steam. And you'll see here, this is just a, a perfect little bow, bent, free bent as it were, not even with a strap. This is a little bow that I bent uh, out of kiln dried wood that I shaved with a draw knife after soaking it. So you're going to see we end up at the same result in the end. We just have to follow a slightly different process. So to start out thinking about this dried wood, I think it's important that we back up a little bit and go back to the tree and look how it's built and how it is that a saw interacts with it and then what it is that you can see and read and the information you can garner from the results. So here's an image that shows you something I think is very important to keep in mind, which is when you do see those growth rings on the face of the board, so you see this log here has been cut, that means that the log was cut at an angle. Now that can be because the log was tapered and they cut straight, or it could be because the log was straight and they cut at a slight angle. Most of the time, you're going to have some sort of variation in that log, so you're going to run into these growth rings almost on every piece. If you didn't and the log was dead straight, what you would see on the face of your board would actually look like a series of stripes, which as you remember is exactly what we get once we split and shaved a piece to follow the fibers on the tangential face. So that means one of the most important pieces of information I can garner is going to be from the face of the board. So if you look at this board here, you'll see all these growth rings cutting across it. That is really clear to me that that saw is angled for one reason or another in relation to the way the fibers run. So I've got this drawing over here, and here obviously is a tree that's been cut down so you can see how the, the growth rings are featured. But let's, let's look at it uh, from directly above so we can start talking about the different planes and what they mean. So you see here the tangential plane. Now that is a, a, a tangent to the circle that is this sort of uh, tree stump, and anything parallel to it is going to be the growth rings and therefore called the tangential plane. When you're looking at a flat sawn board like this where you see these growth rings cut across, that is going to be the tangential plane. So let's look at this drawing down here to talk a little bit about how the boards are in the tree itself. So if you look here, you're going to see what uh, I would call a flat sawn board, okay? And this is a quarter sawn board. Now the quarter sawn board goes from the pith to the bark, and it looks like just a series of long stripes and the growth rings cut across the uh, thickness of the board. Over here, the growth rings are more circular and cut across the width of the board, and you end up seeing on a flat sawn board like this, uh, the growth rings revealed on the face of it. Now, there's all sorts of different ways of sawing uh, wood, and you're going to run into boards that have been sawn all sorts of different ways. If you wanted to, uh, and you were doing some specialty sawing, you could take a tree and actually come in from all angles with the saw so that you end up cutting all the boards, either quarter or rift sawn, all the way around. That's very different than through sawing, where you're just going to cut from one top surface and just keep doing it like it was a stack of cards, for instance. If you do through sawing like that, you're going to end up with some boards near the middle that are quarter sawn, some that are rift sawn, which are very close to quarter sawn, and you're going to end up with a bunch that are flat sawn, where what you're used to seeing probably a lot is the growth rings show up as what we call cathedrals on the surface. They're just like little U-shapes on there. That's your general flat sawn board. So I've taken the time to darken in all the growth rings on this board. But before I start talking about what we can garner from this, I have to say we can't garner all of the information we need from a board that was sawn like this. Okay, so there's a distinction to be made between the growth rings and the fiber line. Now the growth rings can tell us a lot about the fiber line in, in one way, but it can't tell us everything we need to know. And here's why. So if I am talking about a tree, and that tree has a twist to it, the growth rings can tell me about the layers. For instance, you can count the years and see how many layers, it, 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 how many years it grew. And you can also know that if you were to split it and, and shave right along those growth rings, that you would be following the fiber line in that direction. But it wouldn't really tell you much about the twist. Now, if it's a split board, that's fine. Or a split piece, the, 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 the piece is going to have the twist in it naturally. We just follow the fibers. But a board's going to ignore that twist. So imagine if I had like a paper towel tube, like a cardboard tube. It has that spiral that goes down it. Okay. Now, if I cut that at an angle, you can see the angle. You'd probably see the end of it start, instead of being a circle, it'll start to appear as an oval. But that tells me nothing about the fiber line going in that twisted uh, you know, rotary pattern. So just keep in mind that it's not the same thing. I know it's a little bit of a, a brain breaker at first. It takes some 3D thinking to jump into this, but I promise you that the process I'm going to show you makes it so we can get that information really easily. But first, I want to start with the information we can get from the growth rings, because they tell us a, a great deal about what's going on here. Now, on the face of the board, it's going to tell us, if we see these growth rings cutting across here, that the saw did not follow perfectly along the growth rings. Okay, So that tells us there's a slight angle there. 
Now, if you're looking at a board and you're wondering, well, that's interesting, but which of these layers is above the other ones? Is this the highest layer or is this the highest layer? How do you tell? Well, it's pretty easy, actually. If I'm looking at the inside of the tree here, okay, so you see the growth rings. You can tell the inside of the tree from the outside. On the inside of the tree, well, the inside layers are higher. On the outside of the tree, the outside layers are higher. So later on, when it comes time to shave or cut, we're going to really, uh, it's going to become very easy to see what's going on. Now, it might be tempting to turn the board on its side and try and read what is going on there. And that is a pretty good instinct because later on it is going to work that way. But if it's a sawn board, it isn't always the truth. And here's why. And I'll show you a couple examples of this. So I've got this little board here. And you can look at the side here and you see there's straight growth rings in there at a slight angle. So it'd be pretty easy to say, well, that must mean something. But really what it means is that this board was cut at a specific angle in relation to the fibers and the growth rings. And that actually dictates the angle of those lines. And you can really see that when I cut it at a, in a wavy pattern here. So I cut it in a wavy pattern. And you can see it makes a wavy pattern. It's really just a response of how the saw is cutting through it. The only way that you can actually trust those growth rings on the sides is if you've split the board like I did here. So once you've split it, and we know that splitting follows the fibers, then those lines are going to mean something. They're not just a relationship between the saw and the growth rings that you're seeing. It's actually literally where the fibers run, and therefore those growth rings are being seen clearly, and you can trust them to dictate which way you might be shaving this piece. This is a really great example to help show you what I'm talking about. So if I look at the edge of this little board, these growth rings on the edge, as I see them, seem to follow really cleanly in line with the fibers here. So I might say, hey, look at that board. I got so lucky. That one really follows it. And you might look over here and say the same thing. Look, it's just a great board. It's just really straight when I see it on the edge. But you got to remember, those are sawn edges. When I split the board, surprisingly enough, it started to split here, and it split off at quite an angle. And that is that twist I was talking about. So the fibers, uh, of course, they, they stack this way fine, but they're all running at a, in a, a bit of a spiral pattern. So it really spun it out that direction. And now look what happens when I open it up now and I look at it. Indeed, it actually runs really far across there. So the relationship here is very different. If I look on the edge of the sawn piece, I see this and I, I'm fooled into thinking that it's nice and straight. When really, when I split it, I see that it's more like that, which really makes more sense because if you look at the face of the board, there's lots of growth rings cutting across here. So this can't, it can't be the case that it's actually straight. It has to be the case that it's much more at an angle. So that's a really important way of decoding actually what you're looking at. So now let's take another look at this drawing over here because I want to talk a little bit about why you might select one board over another and where that information lies. So if I've got a board like this you see here where it's got nice uh, very straight growth rings effectively. They're not little tight circles. That tells me this was taken from the outer portion of the tree most likely or at least a good distance from the pith. I like that a lot, and there's a, a big reason I like that. If you look over here, you'll notice that the closer I am to having a board that goes through the pith, the more the wood near the middle is going to be erratic. It's that early wood that grew up very erratically. And when that's the case of having in a board the erratic wood that was early and the smooth wood that's to the outside, I'm getting very different information on there as I look at it. It's not very consistent. Where if you look at this board out here that's further from the pith, you're going to see that it only contains a few growth ring years that are all about the same distance from the pith. That's really helpful in getting wood that's more consistent and that I can count on when I'm looking at the center of the board to get a good report about what's going on. And yes, you can see the layers really nicely, but there's a huge flaw in that, which is you might be looking, we'll pretend this board here was quarter sawn. You might be looking at it saying, well, these growth rings run so perfectly. I love how clear it is, and there's stripes on the surface, and I'll just follow those stripes and everything will be fine. And that's fine if your tree has zero twist and the saw followed it. Here's the problem with that. If your tree has a twist, and this is a quarter sawn board, that twist will very quickly cut across this short width that you've got on the edge of your board and yield very short grain pieces that are going to be tough to work with. When I have a piece like this, which is very much a flat sawn piece, and I can see that, yes, indeed, there was a twist that ran out on me, well, I can still run parallel to that new reference face and get lots of good pieces out of this, for instance, for spindles. I can still get great pieces out of that. 
wherein if I'm working on this edge and it turns out to be the case, that is not going to be very useful to me. That amount of twist in there would cut across really rapidly. I just don't have the width on this edge to make up for it, and my piece is kind of a waste. So I would avoid any boards that look like this and come across as quarter sawn. So that's a lot of information about how the, the, the growth rings and the tree and the saw are all interacting and what you end up seeing on the surfaces. But when you go to the lumber yard, of course, you can't split the boards in half and learn as much as you really want to know. So we have to find out really what are we looking for? What, what is it that I'm going to eliminate uh, when I look at two boards? Which one am I going to choose? So what I'm looking at really and looking for, of course, is as few growth rings are cutting across the surface as I can. So I've got a board here where I can see the growth rings are very long. Because the board is thick, it gives me a better chance of getting my material out of it. So when I did split this board, what I saw along these, these lines here is that it's very, very straight about to right here, which is kind of what you'd expect because this is really where the growth rings start really cutting across the surface. That is going to be very common in a board, um, especially when it's from the butt of the tree. So what you're really seeing here is that the tree was growing and then it flared out near the butt and the saw kept going straight and ignore that and cut across a bunch of growth rings. That's why here you see that flare coming out. So really I've got beautiful straight wood up in here and it just sort of like comes out in the fiber line rolls out with it that way. So mostly I expect to cut off those, probably the bottom foot of a lot of these boards I'm gonna find, but I won't reject it outright because this section up here is starting to look really nice and straight. Another thing to keep in mind when you've got a board like this, for instance, that I split and certainly does have some run out to it, well, if the piece that I'm going for has a, a, a larger part in the middle, which just about every piece I'm making does, I'm going to be able to take a portion from one side of the board and from the other and actually follow the fiber line right down the middle of my work piece and everything's going to work out just fine. It's just that the taper comes out on two sides and that allows me to follow the fibers. So keep that in mind. Really getting a thicker board at first is probably a smarter move because it's going to give you a little bit more of that play that you can work with. The thinner the board, the straighter those fibers have to run to actually work out to follow them. So with all that being said, here's the process and it's very, very simple. What I do is I take any board, for instance, this board here, and the first thing I do is I put my fro right in the middle of it. So if this is my board here, I can put my fro right in the middle because we know from uh, our splitting talk last time that equal halves are gonna help run it uh, straight. It's still gonna follow where it's gonna go, but if you start out this way, you know that you're not doing it uneven evenly like this, for instance, where just the unevenness between the two parts you're splitting make it run one way or the other. Now, once you've split it, you're gonna learn a lot. So for instance, on this board here, I split this one down the middle. You know, I had the middle here, and you see it ran off quite dramatically. I really wasn't expecting it to run off that much. You know, the tree had the twist in it, it just didn't show on the surface. So that's fine though, because what I did then is I sawed a bunch of uh, pieces in relation to that now. So that becomes my reference. We're all very used to using the edge of a board once you've squared it as the reference. Well, in this case, we just use the center of the board. So you can see I ended up sawing off a bunch of pieces that I now know follow the fiber line that way. But I don't know how they follow the fiber line this way in, in, in uh, the face of the board. Now, when I look at the side of these, and you can see that my fibers actually have quite an arc to them. Now, over here, what you see is I took one of these pieces and I sawed so that I was parallel to those growth rings as I see it on the edge here. And sure enough, what I see there is now the growth rings. I can see one color of growth here. And on this one, I start to see the growth rings the same way. You can see this one darker color running the entire length. So now what I've got effectively, just after taking a piece like this, take it to the bandsaw and I cut all that off, all of a sudden, I've got a piece that really follows the fiber line just as though I had split and shaved it. And that's the basic process. It's really simple. run you through that process with this piece. Now obviously I've already split it in half and you can see how that played out for me. So now I'm just going to grab my fro here. Now I can take it to the saw but I want you to see that really these fibers do run through this piece. It's, it's quite dramatic and, and it's going to follow the same uh, path as it did previously and you'll see 
what happens. Now, you can see now how it's going to run out the side, and it's running just the same parallel to that line that I had first in the middle. So that's why I can now use that as my reference face. So if I want to, and I'm really concerned about my pieces, I'm probably just going to draw it in there and take it to the bandsaw and cut it parallel to that. So now I've got a piece that is very close uh, to following my fiber line on my edges here. And when I look at it here, I can see pretty clearly that the growth rings run just like you see here, and then it starts to run pretty close here. And if you look at the side here, the growth rings certainly do cut across a lot down there, and that's really what I'm seeing. Same thing up here, the growth rings cut across. So I'm gonna come here now, and I'm gonna follow that. And this is gonna yield a really nice, uh, probably pretty large piece of wood here. But first I'm gonna take it to my bandsaw and cut that off. And then we go into the process of shaving it. So I've shown you how to split the board so you can find the fiber line, but of course you can always go to the edge of the board if you like and use a draw knife as well. In this dry wood, it's no pleasure to do, but it still works. It still shows you exactly where you are. And in fact, it probably does it uh, slightly more refined because you're not dealing with the fact that something is being split in half and then running off a little bit and all the forces that happen in splitting actions that can sort of, sort of push it one way or the other. This way you can literally find exactly where it is. So I'm gonna show you how I do that. So the first thing I need to do is establish which direction I think I wanna cut. So if I take a cut to it and it's smooth like that, well, that's a bad sign. That is not the direction I want to go because that tells me I'm kind of coming downhill to the fibers. I want to go into the end grain of the exposed fibers. So I'm going to try this other direction. And sure enough, it's leaving me a slightly rougher surface, especially where I come out of the cut, where I'm coming up and out. Those fibers are rough, so I can run my finger here. And sure enough, I feel them as I'm cutting across here. So I'm going to come in here. And I'm seeing those rough fibers, so that's a good sign. And I'm getting a bit of a splitting action now because it's getting low enough that it actually is staying uh, solid ahead of my draw knife here. And I just have to go until I get to the bottom of that split. So now that I've done that, I can cut either direction and it's gonna be clean because now, just like with any piece of wood I would ever be using that was green, I've actually followed the fiber line. So now that I've followed the fiber line there, I can come in and I can go parallel to it, okay? Just like that, and I'm gonna get good pieces. I can also look at the edge now that I've done that and really start to trust what's going on with these growth rings. So I can see it comes off a little bit here and a little bit off of that side, and that's gonna give me my clean piece. So I took that piece and now I sawed it, uh, so it follows the growth rings on the, on the two faces. So I looked at the sides that I that I'd, uh, first shaved and then I sawed parallel to it. And then I cut the two faces following those growth rings. And now I have what is a really nice rift sawn piece of wood. So basically the growth rings here, it's easier to see over on this side I think, the growth rings go from one corner basically to the other. So that's how my growth rings are running. This kind of piece can be very confusing at first if you engage it in the wild. So basically, if you come across a, a board that's got uh, stripes running down here, in other words, the growth rings look like long stripes here, and they look like long stripes here, it can be really confusing uh, from the start. You don't exactly know which ones to start with and which ones uh, to ignore. So once again, I just have to stress, what you want to do is follow it on the edges first. So first, I'm going to follow my fiber line either by splitting the board or I'm going to follow my fiber line by shaving it. Once I've done that, then I can trust that these are the lines that I want to be following and then I'm going to address what's happening on the face of my board. So it's always edges first, especially when it comes to these somewhat confusing riffs on pieces. So now I've got those two pieces that I've just split and sawn and followed the fibers as best as I could in a rudimentary way, but it's important to know that I left them large. I look at these like this is about the size of piece I would split out for a spindle from a log as well, so I could make sure that I could really refine it with the draw knife once it's nice and soft. So this is how I soften it up. Basically, I've got this uh, pipe here, and it's full of water, 
and you see I've got a bunch of pieces soaking in here. So you got pieces as long as you would need for an arm bow, and I've got some pieces that are shorter for spindles and whatnot, but all of these pieces are put in here, and they're all soaked, and then they're shaved. And as you can see on this, on this soaked one, I hope you can see that, you can follow those growth rings just perfectly. It's just the same as if it was green wood after it's been in this water for a few days. You're probably gonna wanna change the water out every once in a while or it's gonna get a little bit funky on you. And I don't leave it soaking in here forever. I just try and do it for, you know, like three, three days to a week or so. I don't think it has any benefit for staying longer. But if it's underwater, it's also not gonna rot up on you. All it's gonna do is get a little slimy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop these two pieces in here now. And I'm gonna pull out some other pieces so I can show you exactly how nicely this wood is gonna shave now that it's been rehydrated. So now I've got my soaked piece here, and you can see it's nice and soft. Now, when I go to shave this, this is a very rift sawn piece. One of the nicer things about splitting wood from a log is you're able to dictate which part has a uh, tangential and which part has a radial plane, so you can generally get it pretty nicely lined up with a tangential because watching those growth rings peel away makes things pretty clear. You're gonna see later when I show how I shave a spindle that I've got a piece that's oriented that way, and it is a little bit simpler. This one is quite rift sawn, so in this case, what I wanna make sure I do is I stick with what I know about the edges. So I wanna to go to my edges first again. Just like when I was splitting and sawing the board, the edges are what counts first, then I'm gonna take care of the face. So first I wanna make sure I'm working from the edges, so I'm gonna start just like you would see me do before with any piece of wood that I'm trying to shave at a shave horse. I'm gonna to go to the middle here, and I'm gonna take a nice shaving, and you can already see how nicely that cuts. So I'm gonna come in here, and I'm gonna take a shaving, and I'm gonna pull up and out, and sure enough, there's broken loose fibers here. You can feel that they're coarse, it's like smooth, and then it gets coarse. I'm just gonna follow the smooth, and then shave away all that excess material as I go. This is gonna take a little bit more sensitivity on your part than say oak wood because the clues are a little bit less obvious, especially in this case where it's rift sawn, you can't see much of anything except for those broken fibers. So now I'm gonna come this way and sure enough, it's gonna start to dive on me a little bit extra on this side. I can feel it already, it's starting to dive a little more, but that's okay, that's what it's supposed to do and that's what I expect. So now I'm gonna come in here. Didn't go too far on me. Luckily, I think I had shaved this pretty well before, sawed it pretty well before. And so there's my line right there, okay? And I still have plenty of material to get my bow. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go and do the opposite face. I'm gonna start off at this end now. I'm gonna pull this way. And as expected, it's gonna drop out on me a little bit. Again, I still think I have my thickness quite nicely. If I was worried about my thickness, I wouldn't have started at that very end. I would have just done this bit here and that bit there, kind of like I showed in that little image before, uh, um, drawn in Sharpie, where it shows that you could just take a little bit off of each side and actually just cant the, the visual of the piece in your workpiece here and see what you're doing. But in this case, I ran the whole length of it, and I still think I'm gonna have plenty of material because it didn't split out too deeply. So now I'm gonna start back in the middle of this one and bring it down, and just follow my process just like I did before, where I come off both ends. Now, it can be pretty confusing because when I look at these edges here, the, uh, the, or on the face here, these lines look like they're running all over the place a little bit. It doesn't look perfect um, as, as I wished it would. So what I need to keep in mind though is that when I look here, I can see that indeed things are off a little bit and I can correct for that now. And when I do, those lines will straighten right out. So when I look at this, I can see what uh, is going on here. And I'm gonna start out up here on this face and I can see that if I pull from here out, Sure enough, I've got my broken fibers there, and you can see that the splitting action I'm getting, and then, it's so cool, it also just straightens those lines right out. So now I've got straight lines and straight lines on both faces. This is just acting exactly like a split piece of wood at this point. So now, I'm gonna come this way, and sure enough, those lines straighten right out for me. It's digging in a little bit. I expect that to happen because I can see it on the side here when you look at those lines. Sure enough, they dive down a little bit at this end. But now what you can see is I've got these lines that run all the way perfectly down that on those two faces. Now I just have to do this face and then I know that I'm following my fibers all along. All right. Come up 
this way. Okay, looking pretty good. So now that I've got it very much in the ballpark of following those fibers nicely, I'm just gonna start going to my size and bring it down just like you saw me do with the red oak. Um, the only real difference here is that I don't have the growth rings quite as visible to show me where I'm going, but it's just a matter of sizing it up now. So I'm gonna start here in the middle. I'll start, start on these two faces. What I'll do is I'll just bring it down to my 13 16 dimension this way. I'm not worried so much about these ends because they taper out anyway. It's really in this middle that that 13 16 dimension is so critical. Okay. And then I'll go this way and make it 13 16 Of course, you should probably measure this out and lay it out. I've just done a bunch of these, so I have a good feeling for what, what dimension I'm going for. starting to get a nice 13 square there. That looks nice. Now, if I want to, I can still make it so that my tangential face is the face that's going against the form. And the way I'm gonna do that is by making an octagon of this now, and I'm gonna thin out these, these ends and one of those faces afterwards. So I'm gonna keep it as a round. That way I can choose which one of my faces becomes the three quarter dimension. I don't know if you recall from the last video, but this actually ends up at 13 16 by three quarter. And that way the 13 16 dimension goes against the form and the three quarter dimension makes it easier to bend around. But before I go for that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna octagonalize this thing. And by doing this, it's gonna give me an opportunity to pick a brand new front face. And I'm just gonna pick the tangential face for that. As you can see, it shaves really nicely. There's really, you can't ask for more. This has actually got more moisture in it than normal ash does if you've taken down a tree and split it. It's not even this wet then, it's actually wetter than that. So it's really behaving very sweetly. There we go. All right, let's see what we can do here. Okay. All right. Now that I've made it into an octagon, I'm just gonna pick one of my really nice tangential faces here, and I can see by looking at the end grain which that's gonna be, and I think it should be this face right here. So that's the face that I'm gonna to choose to bring down to my three quarters dimension by shaving. So I'm gonna bring it down a little bit more here, just by shaving the face off of here. And this is creating that nice oval that we were talking about before that helps us out. And now I can actually use those growth rings as a guide to how I'm doing following my fibers, just like I would with a split piece. All right. So that's much more the dimension I'm looking for, that more like three quarters there in the middle. I just have to alter some of these uh, side uh, chamfers that I took off of here to make everything even back up again. And then I'll find myself in a good spot to round it down. So now that I've got it to this point, I'm gonna mark halfway across here, which is uh, 24 and a half right now. Then I'm gonna measure nine inches to each side. This is where that center section exists at three quarter by 13 sixteenths. Nine inches and then there's another nine. So now I'm gonna go back to these ends. And if you remember, one dimension is, uh, uh, is narrower than the other. This is a 3 quarter by 13 sixteenths. I'm gonna taper it from that position here, this line down so it tapers down and becomes 3 quarters by 3 quarters here at the end. And I do that just by shaving two of the faces. That one, okay. 
and then here. Okay, make sure everything tapers really nicely down to three quarter by three quarter. That's gonna work out really well. And then I come back in and I re uh, cut my chamfers on the edges here. And that's gonna be how I finish out the bow before I round it. So now I'm gonna take this bow, round it down, and get ready to bend it. So I want to take a minute just to make sure and to clarify a bunch of the things that I just showed you because it really can be confusing at first. I want to make sure you have as best of a chance as you can at uh, getting clarity here. So normally when I'm working a piece that's uh, been split so that the growth rings are going to go across it like this, you're basically going to get a pretty easy image of what's going on. You're going to have the tangential plane here and the radial plane there. And basically you see stripes on the radial plane here. Those are the growth ring edges. And then on the top, you're probably going to see uh, cathedrals or a little cut across. If, if indeed the uh, layers uh, of the growth rings are variant on that surface, you're going to see something like that. And you're basically going to shave those until you see one color and you don't have any more parts that are cutting across, at which point it will follow parallel to this. So I think the confusing thing for some folks when it comes to shaving is to recognize that to understand what is going on on this surface, often you're really looking at the side. The way that I think about this is the amount of information you get from the side of a stack of cards or paper is very relevant compared to the surface. If I pointed a, a sheaf of papers at you, you're going to see one sheet. You're not going to know anything about that stack. All the information is included on the side of it. And that's the critical thing to think about here. So if I want to know about this, I can see some of the information here by seeing if there's any growth rings that cut across. But really, it's the side with all the info. So if indeed this surface is parallel to those edges, I know I'm following it. Just like a piece of paper would be on the top of a stack. Now, again, that gets a little trickier if you're going to find yourself shaving a piece like this, which you probably are quite often, especially if it comes from the edge of a board, which is rift sawn. In other words, both faces have a series of lines going down them, kind of like the side um, that would be the radial plane normally on a regular uh, piece of wood that was split. But this one just has a bunch of lines everywhere. So again, I have to rely on shaving the sides first. So I'm going to show you what happens here and how that works out, just focusing just on that. Um, so we're looking at this here. So for instance, you can see here on the face of it, these lines kind of run off the side here. So you could mistakenly start trying to shave the sides to follow those, but you don't want to. What you want to do is simply shave the sides so that it follows the fibers. So I'm not actually looking at the surface or the side at this point. I'm simply looking at these broken fibers I see here and pulling up and out and chasing those off of the edge. There. And now that gives me the information I need to know to shave this face because what I look at now is where are these fibers running in relation to this top surface. So for instance, you see these lines here. I'm just going to draw one in and you can see it's just rising up and out like this. It's pretty dramatic cut across on that one. So right now these lines here on the face look like they're at quite an angle. The way I'm going to fix that is I'm going to shave along them until they're parallel to the lines I see on the side and then they'll straighten out. Here's what that looks like. So you can already see that just by following the lines on the side, which were shaved first, now the top straightens out and everything is following the fibers just right. So that is the basic premise of what happens here. I know it's, it's a little bit odd. You're going to have to play with it. I, I totally suggest grabbing like a two by four, splitting it up, playing with it at the bandsaw, play with your drawing knife, do what you can to start to get a feel for what matters here. But what you can't do is just like go to the surface here and start following these lines. They don't mean anything that way. What they mean is that this surface has got a relationship to this side that isn't correct. I know it sounds kind of strange to say. Anyhow, that's what I want you to do there. And then there's one more piece of advice I want to offer you, which is if you find yourself, let's say you had a piece where these, these lines on the side really dive down over here. They really take a dive. If you need to take off a huge chunk of material, in green wood, I'd say just go for it. It'll split away and cleave cleanly. 
Sometimes it doesn't work quite as well in wood that's been rehydrated like this. So I wouldn't just go back here and yank following my line. I'd probably take some material here and a little bit more back and a little bit more back. Give these uh, shavings a chance to curl. And I think if you do that, you're gonna find that you get much more consistent and predictable results. So here you're gonna see me shaving a piece of wood that does have the tangential and radial planes aligned as though it was a split piece. And you can really see right there, it was very simple and clear to chase those growth rings right off the edge. I just started out here on the uh, tangential surface, chase them right off the edge, and because the other surfaces were split, I'm really right in the ballpark. This, this was probably split from the center area of a board where it's more obviously tangential. It's not quite the riff sawn you're gonna get from the edges of the board. I, I recommend you do that at first. Give it a try. It'll get you much more used to what you're seeing as well as trusting in the process. But really what you're seeing here is the same process you saw me go through with the oak. I'm just gonna get my piece squared up and following the fibers, get it down to my uh, dimension that I wanna use for the uh, spindles. And then I'm just gonna do a little shaping on it. So now I'm ready to go ahead and bend that piece of ash that's been steaming for about two and a half hours. So this operation now introduces a new piece of equipment which is the bending strap. So I've got my strap here and it's got its stops and its long handles and this is a piece of spring steel and I need to clamp that in place into the strap then I need to put it onto the form. So I really want to have everything in place to know what's going to happen here and have it be pretty clear and obvious. I don't want to, again, be thinking about what I'm supposed to be doing or certainly not missing any equipment once I pull that hot piece out. One thing I do before I put that piece into the steamer, so it's been soaking, it's shaped, I always check to make sure that it's about an eighth of an inch shy of the interior length of this strap. Surprisingly, when you soak this ash, it actually grows in length. I was surprised by it, but it grew substantially in length to the point that I couldn't even fit the strap on there when I first went to do this without cutting it. So first I wanna take it out before I even put it in the steamer and check it for length. The steamer doesn't seem to have much of an impact on lengthening it, but the soaking sure does. So now what you're gonna watch is something that's gonna look a lot like what you saw before, only with the added element of the strap. Okay. 
So I'm guessing I should have spent a little more time letting, getting these little ends out here. But in general, it made the bend pretty nicely. Pop those suckers out of here. Let this open up just a hair, hopefully enough to get those out. There we go. Like I said, thinking is not easy when you're doing a bend. <laughs> There we go, that worked out beautifully. So that piece went really well. It, it took the bend beautifully. There's not a fiber lifted on it or any flaws to it. And there was even a little inclusion on the compression side of this. So I thought that might give me some trouble. And while it kinked ever so slightly, it really didn't distort the bend at all or break. So I'm really impressed with how that worked out. So hopefully this gives you a view. If you don't have access to the green wood, there's no reason you can't build a chair this way. So I thought it'd be worthwhile to take a moment and actually show you how I go about splitting out the spindles from this board. So I select a section. It's not perfect, but it looks pretty good. So I'm going to start in splitting this right down the middle. We'll see how that fiber line runs. And it looks like it's running really beautifully, actually. So I'm going to go ahead and split off a couple more spindles here. Now, I could just go and saw it out, but generally this wood is rigid enough that I'm not going to get that much deflection. The splits should run pretty well, and that way I can just quickly get all the spindles for this I need. So as you can see, it didn't take much at all to pop these spindles out of here. Actually, it's, it's pretty cost effective too, if you think about it. This is about maybe a board and a half, uh, a board foot and a half of wood here. So it's really not that much expense in these spindles. And as you can see, they look like they're running pretty true here. So I'm gonna soak these for a few days. Then I'm gonna take the draw knife to them and make my shapes. Mm -hmm. 